One of the really cool things about being an Auric War Clan player is being able to take models from all of these different armies, smash them all together, throw them on the table, and have yourself a nice big wah. Hi, my name's Moss, and in this video we're going to go over how to win with big wah. We're going to cover units, enhancements, some tips and tricks. Uh, we're not going to go over battalions and battle tactics and grand strategies. I'm going to make a separate video for that. Uh, in which we're also going to talk about deployment and other more technical, competitive aspects of Big Wah. And be sure to keep an eye out for my Big Wah tier list video as well. So let's get started. So first, battle traits. Like, what rules are we actually bringing with Big Wah? So we get to bring the Venom Encrusted Weapons battle trait from Cruel Boys for our Cruel Boys units. We get Mighty Destroyers for our Iron Jaws units which lets us move uh, at various phases uh, through the game, right? Like we can do in the hero phase, we can do normal moves, pile-ins, charges in the hero phase. And then we get war paint from for our bone splitters units, which gives them a six up ward. But this is actually a pretty weak rule. This is actually a pretty weak rule. Get having a six up ward on bone splitters units is not going to do like it's not. It's just not very impactful right the other rules from uh bone splitters would be way stronger like the spirit of gork morka uh right like uh if you roll a six with melee weapons for your hit roll you they explode and you get two hits so that would be way more interesting for uh bone splitters units than war paint a six of board just isn't all that impactful even like tireless tracker, like being able to move uh, five inches in the first battle round, like even that would be more interesting. But I don't know, six up ward, like I'll take it. It's 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 pretty non-impactful though, as as we'll come to see. So the other one of the other rules that we get with Big Wah is a heroic action called Here We Go. Essentially, you roll a die, and if you roll greater than the current battle round, you get a number of Wah points equal to the battle round. So on turn one, if on a two up, you get one point. On turn two, on a three up, you get two points. On turn three, on a four up, you get three points, and so on and so on. This is only really impactful in the first couple of battle rounds. Usually by turn three, if, if we don't have enough wall points, if we're not generating enough wall points, then uh, like we're already super behind, but being able to generate one and then two points in the first couple turns is... Uh, really nice. So, what exactly are WAP points and how do we get them? So, WAP, we accumulate WAP points over the game in, in various ways. If your general is alive at the start of your hero phase, you get D6 points. If you have a War Chanter alive, you get two points. Not for every War Chanter, but just if there's a War Chanter alive. And if you have a Bone Splitter's Wizard alive, you get one point. So, that means that we get. Um, it, we, we, if we, if all these units are alive, right, we're going to get three plus D six points. Additionally, whenever we complete a charge, we get a point. And at the end of the combat phase, if we're stuck in combat, we're going to generate a point per unit. And that can be important later. Be sure to check out my, uh, my battle tactics or I can't remember. I don't know what I'm going to call it video for big walk. Cause there's some pretty, there's some pretty neat ways that you can uh, deploy your army. Like, spoiler alert, if you're playing against an Alpha Strike army, if you have like a line of Ard Boys with like a, a hero behind, or two heroes behind, you can actually get like three units stuck in combat, because they're all within three inches, um, pretty safely. So if you're going to get charged, you can do that, and then you can generate like three points. So it's like a, it's like a strategy for deployment against Alpha Strike armies. Uh, you kind of deploy castly a lot of times with this army. Anyway, so what do the wall points actually do? So once we generate eight wall points, we get plus one to run. When 10 points, we get plus one to charge. 12 points, we get plus one to our magic. 16 points, we get all out attack for melee weapons. And 20 points, we get plus one to wound for melee weapons. <clears throat> An important thing to remember here is that these buffs only apply to auric units. They do not apply to things like uh, Marsh Crawler, Slaga, they don't apply to, to Hobgrots, they don't apply to our allies, they don't apply to Rogue Idol. There's lots of units that, you know, would be strong in this army, but unfortunately they will not get the benefit of this 
uh, sub-faction ability, which makes them a lot weaker, right? It makes those units weaker. So it's only for, for auric units and only for melee weapons too. So, you know, our, if we got plus one to hit, plus one to wound to our bull boys, it'd be pretty dope. Not gonna lie. Anyway, at 24 points, that's our big wah wah. So, when you call the wah in big wah, for that turn, you're gonna get plus one to the attack characteristic of auric melee weapons. But at the end of that phase, we go back to zero points and we lose all of our buffs. So, you have to... It's, it's not like an auto call, right? In Cruel Boys, we're going to set up our our positioning, and then we're going to, like, really strategically call the Wah to try to kill a bunch of our opponent's stuff off the table. That works. In Iron Jaws, we're just going to charge and call the Wah, right? When we're ready to attack, we're going to call the Wah. We're going to get a whole bunch of extra rend, right? And, and it's great. But in Big Wah, you can't just call the... There's no, like... Ne oh yeah, usually I call the wall turn two, right? I usually call it turn two, maybe turn three. A lot of times it's better not to call a wa. If you're ahead, don't call a wa. Give yourself that plus one to hit, plus one to wound. Just just grind your opponent out. If the game's really close and it's still pretty early, I would hold off. I would keep those buffs. Those buffs are really strong. If you're behind, I mean that's a or if if you if it's close and you you feel like you can get one good turn. You know, charge a bunch of units in and boom, right? You're going to call this big wah and try to try to slay your opponent like you can do it. Or if, or if there's a threat on the board that you're really afraid of and you got a double reinforced unit of brutes charging in and smashing in and you want to just make sure it dies, right? Like, there's no right answer on when to call a wah. There really isn't. You have This is the kind of thing that you get just by playing games. A uh, big wah... I've heard it described, if you're familiar with Magic Gathering, as a as like the blue deck of the Destruction Army. There's all these different options, all these different tools, and you're really being reactive to what your opponent is doing and trying your best to counter their threats to the best of your ability. So if you look at WAP points, so what like sort of what we can expect. So turn one, we're going to get... A, and this, again, is... So we're going to make two assumptions, that we're going to keep all of our important... Wa point generating heroes alive, and we're going to successfully get here we go. If your important uh, Wa generating points are being killed off early, you, you, you're you going to suck. Your army's going to suck. You don't get those buffs. Like, it'll take you way longer to get those buffs, and then we're, we're losing a lot of the value of our army. So, uh, we'll talk about that in here in a sec. So, minimum on turn one, I, I can expect about four points, minimum, uh, through about ten. But realistically, if, if we're getting like, let's say we get three on our on our D6 roll, right? Three, four, five, six, seven points. You know, we're sort of sitting at seven. Turn two, it'll be about the same, right? If we get like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, now we're sitting at 15 points. So one of our goals is to have 12, 12 points at the beginning of turn two. So after we generate our WA points, like when we're entering into our hero phase proper, we wanna have 12 points. That gives our casters plus one. That's going to be really great. Um, that means that our teleport spell has plus one. It means that, like, we have a, we tend to have a lot of spells in our in this army, because our war, uh, no, not our war chanter, our wargog prophet has a very important spell we want to cast, and our sorry, our wargog prophet is a two spell caster. Our weird knob shaman has the teleport spell that we really want to get off. So making sure that that actually happens by turn two that that's a that's a nice marker to think that yes like i'm on pace i have 12 points going into turn two we really want to have 20 points as fast as possible it's technically possible to, to enter into turn two with 20 points but you know 20 points is uh, where we want to be as fast as possible that gives us the plus one to wound right another thing to think about is that because we generate wall points by charging you can sort of look at your table and say like Okay, I have like I'm like I have 14 points. I need 16 points to get that plus one to hit. So if I charge two units in, that'll give me the 16 points, and then for the ensuing combat phase, I can get uh, that plus one to hit, right? So that's why it's kind of a blue deck, right? It's like you have to kind of do some math sometimes and think about things, right? Uh, also, 
generally speaking, it's a good idea to at least try to get a couple of points in the first turn by charging and getting in and st sticking in combat. This is going to land to some of the consistency that, that we always want to have in an army. You know, it's, it's just nice to, you know, reliably or at least more reliably get higher up the, that wall point buff ladder. Because um, then, yeah, like you're going to win more games. Things are more consistent. You're going to win more games. 20 points as fast as possible. While still stalling. Anyway. So what are the core strategies in this army? The longer the game goes on, the stronger we get. The more wall points we have, the stronger we are. If you get really good at generating wall points, like if you find a list in the, in your meta where you can generate a lot of wall points really quickly, you could theoretically call multiple waz over the course of a game, but that's going to be quite uh, difficult. But the longer the game goes, the stronger we get. Ard boys, a unit of five Ard boys, go, goes from unexpected 2.67 damage versus a 4-up save to a 4.44 expected damage versus a 4-up save, which is a 65% increase in damage. I know that when we're talking about these small numbers, it doesn't seem that impressive, but when you're applying that buff to your whole army, if most of your army is still alive when you have 20 points, if you haven't lost a lot of units, or if you've traded very efficiently, so you have like a points advantage on the table, and now you're getting this buff to all your army, like all of a sudden your units are quite scary. Like a double reinforced or a single reinforced unit of brutes staring down some monster with plus one to hit and plus one to wound. Like I know brutes get plus one to wound uh, against larger targets, right? But like they're suddenly just like terrifying. They're suddenly just terrifying. So. That's kind of the idea, right? We want to stall, 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 and then our opponent's just going to lose to... We're going to have more value in our army. Uh, it's So I've already mentioned this, but we it's kind of nice to generate somewhere between, like, 2 to 6. I wrote 4 to 8, but, I mean, even two, 2 to 6, like 2 or 4 wall points in the first turn or 2, that's always really good to help us. We, we can't just sit back the whole time. Our army... Um, we don't like being shot at. We don't have a ton of protection against being shot at. Our Ard boys have a nice four up um, rally, so they're okay. But if we're just getting shot and picked off, it's it's not uh, like we're not we're not gonna win that game. If we're just getting shot and picked off, it's not great. Um, we must protect our point generating units. We must do. We must. If they get picked off early, we're screwed. If we lose our general in the first battle round, if we get alpha struck or stormcast messes with us, shoot cast something, and they blow our general off the table, it's rough. It's rough. Deployment in this army is very important. Be sure to check out that video. Another core piece of the strategy is list building and overcoming the choice overload that comes with having so many bloody models to pick from. We have so many models to pick from. So a good way to think about it is you have different roles in your army and you're going to pick the best units to counter the meta in the, in your uh, gaming group or whatever. Uh, so, like I said, there's so many. Be sure to check out my um, Cruel Boys tier list video. Or no, my uh, Big Wah unit tier list video for more specific information about each all these individual units. Another little note here. When you're evaluating a unit, you can't evaluate it the same way that you would in its home faction. For example, Gore Gruntas are amazing in Iron Jaws. They're like a staple in that army. The more Gore Gruntas, the better. But in Big Wa, it's it doesn't have the same value. We're not trying to Alpha Strike. We are not an Alpha Strike army. So having a bunch of Gore Gruntas just doesn't make sense in our army. The value of those units are different. Yeah. It's quite, uh, it can be quite fun to list build in Big Wah. Quite challenging. Quite challenging. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, like another thing too, like Hobgrots, right? Like they're not, they don't have the same value because they're not getting the buffs. I know they don't get Venom Encrusted Weapons, but they're not getting any of the other buffs. Rogue Idol, same problem. Not an Auric. So he's not getting any of the buffs. I mentioned that, right? I did mention that, right? All those buffs only apply to Aurochs. So, yeah. Allies aren't aren't super great in Big Wah. Okay, so here are some key sort of wizards slash support units in Big Wah. I wanted to mention a few of these so that when we talk about the enhancements, we can have a, a reference point for what kinds of units we're going to be using these enhancements on. So, Auric Weird Knob Shaman, this is most likely our general. 
he's the only one that can cast a teleport spell. The only model that can cast a teleport spell. Teleports are really strong, especially when combined with Mighty Destroyers and Fasten. You can teleport a unit exactly where it needs to be, get it into combat, right? Generate that point, generate another point, hopefully for being in combat at the end of the combat phase, and uh, answer what your opponent is bringing to the table. It's also really nice to teleport cruel uh, uh, bolt boys around the table, right? It's like I'm going to teleport these archers, you know, 23.9 inches right behind a target that I want to snipe early, take those shots, snipe the unit. Like it feels really good, really good. One of the reasons that we want to take the Weirnob Shaman as our general is because you can give him Master of Magic. Having more reliable teleports is great. And if we have 12 points at the beginning of, uh, or when we're starting our hero phase in the second battle round, re-rolling with a plus one is is awesome, right? Re-rolling with a plus one is is awesome. The great, the great big green hand of Gork, it has a casting value of seven. So that plus one goes a long way in helping. That plus one with a plus one and a re-roll, it's like we're, we're looking good. We're looking good. Previously, uh, people were running Auric War Chanters as their generals and giving it an arcane tome because then it could also take uh, the, the great, the, the great big green hand of Gork. But with the recent change to that artifact power, you you can't take a spell. So all of a sudden, we need Weird Knob Shaman back back again because having two War Chanters, one of them that could teleport was was definitely better, right? Because you're getting all the other abilities that come with a War Chanter, uh, but you're not getting those units, or you're not getting um, like the beats, for example, with a Weird Knob Shaman. So, but that's okay. And then we got Wergog Prophet. So this is easily the best Bone Splitters Wizard. Uh, I, I wrote honorable, honorable mention to Maniac Weird Knob, and that's I mean I don't know I kind of I kind of changed my mind a little bit on this. I like Maniac Weird Knob. I wish that I uh, like I wish he was better and I could play him more. Giving plus one to wound is a pretty good buff, but I don't know. I wrote it I wrote it there anyway. If 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 for fun, if you wanted to go more for like a Bone Splitters list for Big Wall, like you wanted to run some Boar Boys, I could see running a Maniac Weird Knob. Um. Yeah, I mean, the Wargog Prophet has his ability where, like, it's 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 nicknamed the Laser Beam, right? But it's the, I can't remember what it's called, it's like the, it's called the Stare, or whatever. Uh, the Wargog Mask. That ability is so strong. It's so strong, especially if you combine it with a Ward, but we'll, we'll talk about that during Enhancements. But it, but he's great. Wargog Prophet is easily the best uh, Bone Splitters Wizard that, that, that you can take in this army. So here's some key frontline units. We have our Ard Boys. They're our best battle line. They're cheap, right? Like a reinforced unit of, of Ard Boys only costs 10 more points than a unit of Gut Rippers. They have one better save than Gut Rippers. They have more attacks than Gut Rippers do. They like they're just they're just great. Ard Boys are are our bread and butter battle line. A four up rally, that's great. Like they're just awesome. Gore Gruntas are another really good one. They can Mighty Destroyers themselves, so they can move nine inches in the hero phase, move m nine more inches in the uh, movement phase, and then charge in. So they're they're great, right? They're really tanky, and again, that's what we want in this army. We want to stall, stall, stall. So what is it? 170 points for 15 wounds and a f and a four up save, right? Tons of mobility. They're great and brutes. Uh, relatively tanky, like brutes aren't the, aren't the tankiest uh, unit of the game, but they are battle line, which is really important. They have lots of good uh, attack profile options. They deal some good damage. If you throw, um, oh geez, what's it called? What's the other uh, ability the War Chanter has? Um, it gives plus one damage to to uh, melee weapons. Oh, it's gonna bug me if I don't remember it. Uh, Violent Fury. So Violent Fury. So being able to throw all that damage, oh my, plus one to hit, plus one to wound, and plus one damage on brutes, like man, do they get they get scary quick, and they're good against bigger targets, right? Uh, duff up the big thing, right? They get essentially an all-out attack for things that have a wounds characteristic of four or more. So they're a good answer, right? They're a good answer against monsters, against mounted heroes, all kinds of things. They are great.
Let's see. So some key damage units. Where are my cruel boys at? So bolt boys are obviously really good. Uh, they're the only really good source of range damage. They're good without any support. They're good in, in groups of three or groups of six. I would avoid putting them in groups of nine unless something in your meta is really calling you to do that. They, you know, obviously with a Swamp Call of Shaman, they're even better, but you can teleport them around the map, right? You can teleport them and snipe some stuff. They're great. They're great. Nash Tooths are also really good, right? They have, they're, they're nice and fast. They have good damage. They have a three up save. So they're gonna be they're gonna be tankier. They're gonna be able to, to survive a little bit better with that all-out defense, right? We're going to a two-up save, very good. Um, break a boss, smashy, smashy, bashy, bashy. Everyone knows that break a boss can slap. Uh, you can also take uh, fasten, right? So you can teleport a break a boss fasten, fasten, and he can punch above his weight class for sure. And the, kill the boss on Vulture. Uh, fast and slappy, right? This the killer boss on Vulture is really cheap. Like for 220 points, like he's a bargain. He's a bargain, in my opinion. Uh, being able to issue another command is also really nice. But he's great. Fly around. Um, yeah, like and he's he's good to stall too because if your opponent is throwing something in your back line or teleporting things around or trying to flank you, he can zip over to one spot, deal with that threat, and then fly back the other direction and come and help somewhere else. Like, he's great. He's great. Uh, he can get his charge in too, which is nice. Okay, so command traits. So if you're taking a Cruel Boys general, Super Sneaky is good. Super Sneaky is always good. It's always nice to move something else out on the map. But one thing I can't remember is if if you take super sneaky does it have to be a cruel boys unit that you take super sneaky uh yeah it has to be a cruel boys unit so i mean i don't really recommend like i've already made my thoughts clear about who i think should be your general but if you really want to take a cruel boys general super sneaky is your best call i think uh iron jaws and bone splitters there's not really any there's not really any uh, really good command traits. The problem with them is that some of them rely too heavily on having units in their own faction, right? So, like, for example, um, Mega Bossy from Iron Jaws lets you call Mighty Destroyers again, but you're not running a ton of Iron Jaws units. Like, you're running some, right? Uh, and some of them just don't apply at all. Like Mighty Wall Leader, it says if you, when you call the Iron Jaws Wall, well, the, you're not calling an Iron Jaws Wall. So it's like, that's useless. And then same thing with, with the Bone Splitters command traits, right? It's like, uh, you know, one of them is when you use the Tireless Tracker. Well, you, you don't have access to that, right? Um, another one is uh, like the Monster Kill. It's after this general fights for the first. It's like, you don't want to fight with your general, you know? So, none from really the Iron Jaws or the Bone Splitters are very good. And easily the best one is Master of Magic. It's so good. It's so good that it makes me wonder if this command trait should be removed from the game. Should it be removed from the game? It's a question of, do we want to give tools to all armies to add consistency? Or, do we want to have all of the command traits be faction based so that the game is more interesting if everyone's running master magic arcane tome it's boring it's boring right but don't we want to bring some consistency to a to a dice game like i do i don't know it's an interesting question please let me know in the comments below what you think about master magic and other really powerful universal enhancements being in this game please let me know so artifacts of power uh, you can throw Mork's Eye Pebble on a Cruel Boy. That's okay. Like, that's good. You have that nice aura around you that you can uh, defend against shooting. That's good. Uh, Iron Jaws. If you, you could take Destroyer. That is such a strong artifact of power. Being able to add three damage to, like, the the weapon of a Mega Boss is just great. It's just a great, uh, great artifact of power. However, the Bone Splitter's Glow and Tattoos is phenomenal it gives a four up ward to a bone splitters unit and so you here's here's the combo okay you your Wurgog prophet starts with a six up ward right all the bone splitters models have a six up ward but with glow and tattoos you change it to a four up ward 
So why that's relevant? Well, it's it's one, it's it's obviously good because you want to keep that Wargog Prophet alive. So having a four up ward, right? If you get shot at, if you have spells cast against you, you're going to be able to survive them more easily to continue generating those wall points. But more importantly, when you go to use your Wargog Mask ability, Right, the Wargog, just for those of you that don't know, the Warg, the Wargog Mask ability is absolutely busted. It's awesome, I love it, it's a great ability, super fun. Um, at the start of your hero phase, instead of casting spells or dispelling on the spells or any of that, you pick one enemy unit within 12 inches. So it's, a, you know, it's kind of a short range. Um, that's visible, right, yada yada. Uh, so you roll a die. On a 3-up, the enemy suffers d6 mortal wounds. Okay, so that's fine. So on a 3-up... The enemy suffers d6 mortal wounds. But you can keep going. You can do it again. And if you do it again, you can just keep doing it forever. So every time that you roll a 3-up, the enemy takes d3 mortal wounds. So, so there is a 2 out of 3 chance you're going to deal damage to your enemy. However, if you fail, you take d6 mortal wounds. So you can keep going. The Wargog Prophet has 7 wounds. So, you know, like, once you lose twice... Right? If you're taking 2d6 mortal wounds, now you're looking at the average of those rolls being 7, right? So you don't want to fail twice. But you do get to ward off those mortal wounds. So if you have a 4-up ward, all of a sudden half of the mortal wounds that you take are being negated on average. Which means we go from being able to fail twice uh, on average to being able to fail 4 times. Which means we're getting more and more chances to deal D3 mortal wounds. This can go off. You can sit there and keep rolling either a, th a 3 up on that on that first roll or warding off your own damage. If your dice are good, you can just take down giant things. You could be like, oh, that unit of Storm Drake Guard or whatever. Like that, you know, 18 wounds, like it's gone. Like I'm, I'm just going to sit here and keep going. I'm, uh, but I guess the Storm, I guess the... Uh, the 4-up ward against spells doesn't count here. Because um, I, don't, I don't think this, this is on a spell. I, I think. Probably not. Right? But but you get my point. So, a 4-up ward here is great. And the universal uh, slash seasonal enhancements, the um, Season 2 Griff Feather Charm, a 5-up ward, that's great too, for the exact same reason. I've seen lots of lists where people are running two uh, Wargog Prophets, and one gets Glowing Tattoos, and one gets... A Griff Feather Charm. One has a 4-up board, one has a 5-up board. That's sweet. Like, I think I'm a big fan. Like, I'm a big fan. Like, I'm gonna put that on my table, I think, next game I play. Next next game. I, I just ordered some, um... No, but you, you don't care. You don't care about my models. Moving on. Mount Traits. Fasten. Obviously a great choice, right? Everyone knows why Fasten's good. Fasten's a great choice. Weirden is also a good choice in the right meta, because Weirden... Uh, gives a 4-up ward against mortal wounds caused by spells and endless spells. If the meta has a lot of spells and endless spells, throwing a throwing a ward on a on a model is good, right? Like, it could be a break a boss, it could be a Nash Tooth, it could be, um, like, whatever it is that, that you have that has a mount. Again, we're trying to stall. We're trying to stall. So if, if, if a 4-up if a ward against magic is gonna, you know, let your, let your model fight another day, that's great. It, it lets you uh, keep fighting. Like, now you've got the buffs. Now you're going to get to hit again, right? All of a sudden, you know? So so it's good. But if you're if you're not sure or if, or if you're new or if you're just trying out Big Wild, Fasten is always a, always a great choice. I've said this already, but teleporting a unit using Fasten and then having a 3-inch charge is, is very, very, very nice. Especially when... The teleport spell is plus one and reroll, which means you're 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 really likely to get it off. And fasten is just a once per game. You don't, there's no roll at all, so that, that's super consistent there, right? You're charging in, you're getting your point, you're deleting something that was that was a threat for you, like throwing a break a boss into, you know, some some shooters. You know, it's like it's absolutely fantastic. Break a boss is great for that because he doesn't have a damage table, so he can have one wound left after unleash hell and still just delete the unit, right? Get in there, deal a ton of damage, and then you're and then you're good, right? Like they can kill him and that's and that's a fine trade. But if he has a you know, anyway. Yeah, Fasten's great. Spells. Okay. So Lore of the Swamp. All of the spells in Lord in Lore of the Swamp are good. They're all good. But I'm not sure if we're gonna run a cruel voice caster. That's the problem. 
Gobsprack is much better in Big Wah than he is in Cruel Boys because he gets plus one to cast once you have 12 points. So having three spells and having plus one to each of those casts is good. So if, if you really like Gobsprack and you really want to play him, play him in Big Wah. Stick a rogue idol beside him. Play him in Big Wah, right? Then he's, then he's great. Plus two caster, right? Plus two to unbinds. He's fantastic. He's much better in Big Wah than he is in um, in Cruel Boys. So, uh, Swamp Call of Shamans are also, you know, pretty good. You can, if you wanted to lean more heavily into the Bolt Boys, you could do that, right? Stick him next to the Bolt Boys. Have him plus one to cast, right? That works. It's okay. Lore of the Weird. So this is the Iron Jaws spell lore. The great big green hand of Gork. That's your auto pick every time. No, no contest. You're going to take that every single time. You're probably going to take it every single time on every single Iron Jaws wizard that you're running just because it's that strong. Uh, Lore of the Savage Beast. So these are the spells that your uh, Wargog Prophet is going to have. So go Gork and Mork as War Cry is pretty good. Uh, it has a range of 12 and casting value of 7. Uh, in the following combat phase, that unit can only be picked to fight at the end of the phase, so it gives the strike last effect to an enemy unit. So, generally speaking, you're going to want to use his uh, Wargog Mask. Generally speaking. That's what you're going to want to do. But you have to pick a spell anyway, so that one's okay. Still, I mean, like, even the spell, the Wargog Prophet, the spell on his War Scroll is called Fist of Gork. So it has a casting value of 5, right? So with plus 1 to cast, like, that's easy. And it has a range of 24. So this is when it's, you know, outside of our Wargog Mask, right? Our, our Wargog Mask has a 12-inch range, so this is another 12 inches. So if we can't use the mask... Um, so, you know, uh, within range visible to caster, roll a number of dice equal to the number of models in that unit. For each 6... The unit suffers mo one mortal wound. So and there's more to the spell, but let's just think about this for a second. If your opponent has a unit of 10, that's 23 inches away. He rolls, um, right? It's a casting value of five, so it's pretty much going to go off. So if, you, if they have 10, you're looking at one or two mortal wounds, you know, not bad. But if the casting roll is more than, t is 10 or more, so this is nine or more with that plus one, right? The unit suffers one mortal wound for each four up. So if it's a unit of 10 and you roll nine on the dice, which is a 10 up, you know, you're going to deal five mortal wounds. That's really good. And if they have a unit of 30 and you roll a nine up, dealing 15 mortal wounds on average. Like, when this thing's good, it's good. When this thing is strong, it's really strong. And uh, if something's within 12 inches, you're just going to use the Wargog Mask anyway. So these two spells almost feel like like they don't matter. But you have to pick something, right? So Gork Morka's uh, War Cry is fine. You know, if, if you have one wound left and you don't want to use the mask and there's a big threat within 12, you can say, well, you fight last, right? We're going to, we're going to, I'll fight you with my thing first. Um, and then Glowing Green Tusks. So for this one, you have to, so it has a casting value of 5, range of 18. So you pick a Bone Splitters unit, uh, and then you add improve the Ren characteristic by its mounts for by two. So this was more of an honor, honor, honorable mention. If you're going to run a bunch of uh, Boar Boys, then you can run Glowy Green Tusks instead. Again, you're probably not even going to cast this. You're probably going to use something else. But you have to, you know, he's a two spell caster. So, you're, you know, if, if you have to cast a second spell, if you're, if you're going to cast his spells, right? So, but still, like... Plus one or a Mystic Shield is a is a good choice for his second spell too. Again, we're trying to stall, so giving something Mystic Shield, and then teleporting it away, right, and then charging in, like Gore Grunt, his Ard Boys, Brutes, all those things. Giving them plus one to save is is just good. Keep them alive for a little bit longer. Make sure they stay alive so you generate more points. Uh, so in conclusion, I have no image here. That's great. So in conclusion, like how to win with Big Wah, the fundamental strategy is stall, stall, stall. That is one of the biggest important parts of this army. You gotta wait. You're gonna grind your opponent out, you're gonna win late. That's like a big pillar of our strategy. The second big pillar of our strategy is the tool, is the idea of the toolbox. 
we have so many potential options for our army. You need to pick the right answers to what your what your what the meta is providing. What the meta what your opponent is putting on the table really is going to dictate what you're going to have in your list. So pay close attention to that, right? But besides that, so that's in my opinion, that's why this army is a lot of fun. There's lots of options, lots of choices. You can build it in so many different ways. It's great. It's also fun narratively. You can do a list with Gordrak and Gobsprack. Like, that's pretty fun, right? Right? Not super strong, but fun. Anyway, uh, please let me know what you think in the comments below. And be sure to check out the other Bigwa videos. I'm branching out from Cruel Boys into Bigwa. I do want to cover everything uh, Auric War Clans on this channel. My primary focus has been on Cruel Boys because they are my favorite. So... I hope uh, I hope you enjoy. So like, subscribe, and wah.